pleasure to uh, be invited to my first uh, global networking forum presentation. I'm not quite sure uh, how they what was expected, but I was asked to summarize what we did yesterday morning. We were uh, an, introductory, an introduction hors d'oeuvre to the GLEX program yesterday afternoon in this room from about 2 to 5 p.m. We had a Galaxy Forum in China. And with the two subjects being astronomy from the moon and international human moon missions. This is our pilot slide. Uh, and it depicts most of the presenters, I believe all of the six or seven presenters that we had. And I will try and, and give you a, a brief a snapshot of, of each of the presentations, what we did, and, and uh, the conclusions that the presenters made. Uh, first, what, what is the Galaxy Forum program? Uh, it is the main education and outreach vehicle for our organization, the International Lunar Observatory Association. Some of you might wonder what, what, how the galaxy and the moon go together, and we'll, we'll, we'll see as we go forward. We found it's a very good fit. Uh, after all, uh, the immensity of the galaxy, the first big step into the galaxy will be to the moon, uh, from the space station to the moon and onto Mars and beyond. And while I know there's a, a great deal of excitement and talk about uh, Mars missions, uh, here at IAF and, and in uh, USA in particular, there's also a very strong and growing uh, interest and imperative to uh, return to the place where our species, where humanity became a multi-world species, uh, and go from there. And I think uh, that's what will happen. Uh, we will go to Mars and to uh, Europa and Titan and beyond. And I think we will return to the moon uh, much sooner than we have had 80 of the galaxy forums in over 30 locations around the world since our very first one, and we didn't know how many galaxy forums work. We said we're having a forum to talk about the galaxy and how we can help our friends and our neighbors to get out there and see the galaxy. There was an interest rate in the beginning of July 4th in Silicon Valley, USA, where we proceeded with these galaxy forums. A great deal of flexibility in what can be done. Uh, after all, the galaxy is a very big place. Uh, <laughs> uh, the themes, as I mentioned, of galaxy forum uh, in Beijing, in 2017, I should say that this is the seventh uh, galaxy forum we had in Beijing yesterday. We had one other one in China, in Shanghai. Some of them, the one in Shanghai, had over 500 participants. Um, and we enjoyed and every one. I think the smallest one was in the and the largest one was in the middle. Uh, 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 Astronomy from the moon. Uh, we tried the galaxy forum yesterday. Uh, we were about in this room uh, about 75 to 100 people, 75 to 100 people. So we have to talk over your plan. The emphasis on teachers, uh, the Galaxy Forum program has been uh, first to teachers because the vision of the Galaxy Forum program is to advance 21st century education in general. And what is uh, more important to the 21st century than the big picture of learning about our galaxy, learning about Earth and the Earth and the Earth. A little bit short of the higher cosmos, this is the galaxy. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this is the uh, climate, mm -hmm. as huge as it is, uh, uh, can, be, can be explored and, and uh, known. They say we had something of a hundred uh, attendees 
uh, six speakers. The uh, a fair number, of course, of uh, host Chinese uh, participants, teachers, uh, national agencies. There are quite a few uh, Chinese space agencies that are represented. To be他在这儿建一个大学啊 on the subject of uh, astronomy from the moon, uh, Wang Jin from National Astronomical Observatory of China, Haki Mao San from uh, Indonesia, Andong. Uh, I spoke about the International Lunar Observatory astronomy mission. On the second session of International, excuse me, uh, yeah, International Human Moon Missions, uh, Dr. Christian Landa from the Canada Space Agency gave an update on Canada interests in human uh, human exploration to the moon and, and beyond. Um, Dr. Guo Lingli from CASC spoke about Chinese early considerations that are accelerating now as the success of the Chang'e program uh, moves forward. The inevitable question of what next is becoming prominent in China uh, and elsewhere. And we'll have some uh, important conclusions about that. And our last speaker, uh, uh, Dr. Andy Aldrin, who I think gave a, a real fascinating uh, talk about prospects for human uh, missions to the moon in the USA, prospects and, and difficulties. Uh, Wang Jing is the associate principal investigator on the Lunar Ultraviolet Telescope. Uh, I'm, I'm sure, and I just just came so I'm get, uh, from a uh, a session on lunar missions, and I've got my my themes a little bit uh, mixed up. Literally, I, I finished a presentation five minutes ago, um, but. Astronomy from the moon uh, is a reality. The only spacecraft that's landed on the moon in, in, in over 40 years uh, belongs to China. I'm sure you know the Chang'e 3. And maybe some of you, some of you don't know uh, that there's a telescope, the first operating robotic telescope in history uh, on the moon. And uh, I think that China deserves a great deal of recognition and congratulation for, for pioneering this new frontier uh, because I think that the moon will be the next important frontier for astronomy. Um, there are limits to the size of telescopes that one can put on Earth or at least on uh, Hawaii's Mauna Kea. Um, Wang Jing mentioned a, a few uh, of the significant findings, uh, as I mentioned, the Lunar Ultraviolet Telescope, the only instrument operating on the surface of the moon, the only instrument on the Chang'e 3 that is operating, the only science instrument. The 44th uh, day, it can only operate, uh, most people think astronomy is done at night, but on the moon with the, the Lunar Ultraviolet Telescope, it has to be done during the day because of power necessities. At night, uh, the Chang'e 3 shuts down. Uh, the RTG gives it a little bit of heat so that it doesn't die during that 14 day uh, lunar night. And then it wakes up when the sun rises and astronomy, the LUT uh, operates shortly after the sun rises on the moon. So you can do astronomy during the sun, sunlit hours on the moon, um, as long as you don't look directly at the sun, of course. Because there's no atmosphere to provide distortion, 
that you would have doing and, and blocking the the, uh, the light from the stars as happens on Earth. So it's in its 44th day. Uh, there's some remarkably good news for astronomy from the moon that the, the long-feared issue of dust contamination uh, degrading the instrument was not a factor. Uh, the, the loss of uh, resolution on the LUT, and we're talking about, uh, this is a pioneering first instrument, six centimeters. Uh, and, and I don't want to go into all the details of astronomy from the moon, because this session is to recap the entire uh, galaxy forum we had yesterday. But it's very exciting news that dust has not been a factor in, in limiting uh, astronomical observations with the LUT. Uh, the LUT proved that uh, despite water on the moon and water on the surface of the moon, as well as the, the ice water and the coal traps, uh, its presence in the lunar exosphere is extremely small. Um, unlike some Indian projections from India, uh, lunar missions was that there would be significant water in the lunar exosphere. Uh, scientific, we published papers by NMC uh, confirmed that there's, or, or proved that there's very little water in the uh, lunar atmosphere. And finally, uh, the, the Chunga 3 is powered by an uh, RTG, uh, radio uh, isotope, uh, radio thermoelectric uh, generator, uh, radio isotope thermoelectric generator, uh, good for 30 years. Uh, whether the telescope will be operational that uh, time span or not remains on the uh, a decision of the year to year on the Chinese uh, government. Uh, personally, I, I very much hope that it's not turned off uh, or support isn't withdrawn for the uh, maintaining of the Chang'e 3 telescope until at least uh, there are other instruments, other telescopes uh, on, the, on the moon. So that was the first presentation on the subject of astronomy from the moon. Uh, a gentleman who's, who's done a great job, uh, a professor of astronomy, in moderating galaxy forums that were held in Indonesia. Uh, in February, we had a, uh, a very extremely successful galaxy forum uh, in Jakarta at a, a marvelous space education facility known as Skyworld. And Dr. Hakim Marasan, uh, who, who uh, arrived dressed in, in a very uh, uh, dazzling uh, in, in, uh, Indonesia uh, print jacket, um, talked about uh, Indonesia prospects for astronomy uh, and ultimately astronomy on the moon. Uh, Indonesia is one of the uh, strongest supporters of astronomy from the moon, even though it's uh, at an early stage of, of technical development. Indonesia is a vast country, uh, almost the size of the USA in population, spanning 13,000 islands. And it was that size that made a difficult 10-year search to find the best location for Indonesia's uh, uh, 21st century state-of-the-art telescope. And that will be operational in 2019 uh, on Mount Timo, on the easternmost part of Indonesia, a mountain uh, 3,600 meters. The, the telescope is 3.6 meters. That's a nice, uh, a nice uh, equation. There's also a, a telescope under fast construction in Sumatra, the Institute of Technology. A very strong uh, enthusiasm amongst Indian youth for all kinds of science, space science, astronomical science, and other. So uh, Indonesia we, we see as, as pioneering uh, astronomy throughout Southeast Asia, and our organization has formed a, a Southeast Asia principal operating partnership to elevate uh, prospects for uh, space exploration in Southeast Asia on a par with the more advanced spacefaring countries, such as uh, Canada, Japan, China, India, uh, USA, and Europe. Uh, Southeast Asia, in fact, may see the emergence of a, uh, like 
Europe develop the European Space Agency, Southeast Asia may develop uh, CESA, the Southeast Asia Space, uh, Space Agency. Uh, the moderator for the first session on astronomy from the moon, uh, you may recognize from this morning's session of Space Agency heads, uh, Dr. Christian Salaberger uh, in the audience right, right now. Um, and, and Dr. Salaberger is, uh, besides being a, a prominent leader in the IAF, uh, also the uh, president of a Canada space enterprise that is the, the, a partner of our ILOA and the main instrument contractor for our ILOA, Canadensis, based in Toronto, Canada. And Dr. Salaberger, Chris, moderated the Astronomy from the Moon session. There's a uh, Wang Jing from NAOC, which is located just just a kilometer away from here, and uh, Dr. Malasan from Indonesia. Uh, I gave the the third presentation on astronomy from the moon, uh, and talked about the LUT as I just did now. Uh, ILOA has four moon missions. Our flagship mission to the South Pole a high mountain at the South Pole where we hope to land um, in the not too distant future. We have two precursor missions, uh, one being uh, an active mission collaboration with the uh, Chinese astronomers who will turn have, have the uh, opportunity of using our telescope uh, once it's on the moon. We have another precursor mission that may fly this year, not to the, not to the pole, but as part of the Google Lunar X Prize competition. Moon Express is another one of our uh, chief partners. And Moon Express is hoping that their, their launch provider uh, will be ready to take them in six months. The launch provider may have heard Rocket Lab in New Zealand at its very first test last week, 90% successful. I think it's a long shot that it's going to be ready uh, by December uh, to enable Moon Express to, to beat the, the deadline for the Google Lunar X Prize, which is this year. And interestingly, the other leading contender to win is from India. Uh, so it's, it's, it's still a contest, and the game is still on. Uh, we hope, of course, that Moon Express does go. They carry a, a small instrument for us, an LCD instrument, um, which would hopefully conduct the first image ever of the Milky Way galaxy, to take the first image ever of the Milky Way galaxy from the moon, which we think will be um, very influential, perhaps as significant as the first image of Earth from the moon was in the 20th century. You all know that. Earthrise image and the incredible impact it had on, on, on human civilization, seeing spaceship Earth floating there with the moon in the foreground. Uh, when we go back, we hope that we will look not just back at our home planet but in the 21st century, out at our future, out towards the stars. The second session uh, of our Galaxy Forum yesterday was on uh, international human moon missions. We have three presentations uh, from Canada, uh, from the Canada Space Agency, uh, Dr. Christian Langa, uh, who gave an update on Canada uh, developments. There's a new government in Canada, a very progressive government, uh, new Minister of Science, who's uh, pushing things along, and uh, confirms that space exploration is a very key part of the Canada Space Program. And uh, Dr. Langa confirmed also that uh, preparations that are, are underway for the next era of lunar and planetary uh, science and technology. The second presentation in the second session of International Human Missions uh, was a very, very interesting and uh, pioneering presentation. Uh, we learned for the first time 
Uh, it was the first time I believe that any any reference has been made to what comes after the Chunga uh, Six Mission. Well, uh, it looks like it may, it may not be called Chunga Seven or Chunga Eight, but. Uh, Dr. Lingley did refer to a, a, a Changa 7 and 8, and I just came from a, a session on uh, the Chinese Moon program, and uh, the, the uh, many people in the audience did not know that there was any talk of a, of a mission after Changa 6, but Changa 7 and 8 have been talked about now. They may be called something else by the time that comes. Uh, Dr. Lindley's talk uh, dealt with the value of uh, the lunar surface and what were the most important elements there. Uh, the lunar regolith, or soil, uh, was her first topic that she talked about, and of course, that's what will be brought back later this year with the Chang'e 5 launch that's scheduled for late November. Uh, China's first sample return uh, to be launched from the new China spaceport in uh, Hainan Island, where I just came from a few days ago. It's, a, it's an enormous facility. It's China's Kennedy Space Center. And I don't know if you are aware of it, but it's, it's going to be really something for China in the 21st century. Um, if you are interested in going, I strongly advise you to go uh, not in June or July, because it's really hot. But uh, we may well have a Galaxy Forum China in Hainan uh, at the time of the Chang'e 5 launch at the end of November. And the last presentation from the American side was uh, by Andy Aldrin, who, who is the director of his father's uh, Share Space Foundation. Uh, his father, Buzz Aldrin, who is with us today, uh, not in the audience right now, but um, the first moon landing with Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. Uh, Andy is his son, and it's, uh, it's great to uh, uh, be involved when you're talking about uh, going to the moon, returning to the moon, to have a, an Aldrin aboard. Uh, Andy spoke not as an official of NASA, which you know uh, there's some, some difficulties uh, with NASA policy right now, not NASA's fault. Um, but he talked about what are the prospects in, 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 America, in the USA for human mission to the moon. And right now, there's no mission to the moon whatsoever. Uh, NASA's not allowed to talk about touching the moon, maybe orbiting but very interesting restrictions. And it's a complex uh, presentation that, that uh, Andy Aldrin gave. He said that there are three dynamics at work. Uh, one is the traditional, um, traditional models, and he thought that despite talk from the commercial industry, the so-called new space industry, um, it was unlikely that the uh, space launch system, the SLS, the big rocket that's now well along uh, under construction and is looking for its first launch in 2019 now, and the Orion capsule, human rated capsule that would be launched by the SLS. It was unlikely that that would be derailed. There are too many vested interests, despite uh, champions for SpaceX or, or Blue Origin. Uh, being able to do missions cheaper, human missions cheaper, that's unproven. So there's the traditional model that's well entrenched and, uh, and progressive. There's the question of uh, new space commercial missions, and that's been the subject of some discussions here today. When will commercial missions uh, become predominant in, in the space uh, industry, in the space community? Uh, in contrast to government missions. And that's a big question. Um, there's always great enthusiasm for the promise of commercial space. But I think uh, uh, Andy's 
uh, observation that it's the question of when is a real serious question. Uh, our company published a, a, a study called uh, Space Entrepreneurs, a Space Entrepreneurs Directory that included over 200 uh, individual enterprises. And we thought that the, the, uh, the era of commercial space was right around the corner. That was published in 1984. Um, there was a book that in, in, uh, influenced me a great deal called Space Enterprise in 1974. So the question of, to put all our eggs in the commercial space, new space basket, uh, would probably be a very risky thing. The third dynamic is the international dynamic. And while we are here uh, at the International Astronautical Federation, and our mission also advances international, uh, international cooperation in every level, from the USA side, especially given current policies, it's not a guaranteed thing. Uh, the largest uh, entity in space development in the USA is military, which doesn't lend itself to cooperation uh, on an international level. So it's not at all that uh, a guarantee that missions to Mars will be international from a USA point of view. Uh, there's a lot of uh, what White House splits and, and uh, shifting and politicking going on. Nobody really knows what the policy of this administration will be on space or when it will be articulated. Uh, and the ultimate result might be some mixture of these three, uh, three directions, namely uh, traditional space technology hardware such as SLS, Orion, new space commerce, and international cooperation, perhaps some, some mixture of the three. Uh, and as Dr. Dr. Aldrin has his hands in the air, he's not sure either, but he's uh, made a fascinating presentation. Uh, and he's, he's active at the, at the event today. So those were the, the presentations. Uh, we had a, uh, some teachers up who wanted to be in the, in the photo at the end. Uh, and most of the presenters are, are there, uh, some of the teachers, and uh, uh, Hong Tang Guo, who works for the National Astronomical Observatory, China did a great job in, in putting this together for us. Uh, and uh, as I say, uh, well, if you don't know, we're, we're located in Hawaii, the International Winter Observatory Association, which is the center of astronomy uh, in the world, or at least in the Northern Hemisphere, and also a great place to go to space from, because you can launch equatorially as well as uh, in a polar direction, and we hope that that is realized someday. I invite you all to come to Hawaii and enjoy the, the spirit of Aloha and beauty of the islands and the majesty of Mauna Kea, where 13 uh, world-class observatories operated by 12 countries are located. And that was the, uh, that came from Dr. Bo's slide, and thank you for your attention. Uh, we hope to go back to the moon soon. That was what we discussed yesterday. Thank you. So I don't know if that's the nature of a, a global networking forum, but I try to try to talk about so, Sure. I don't know if there's a question or not, or, or it's pretty late uh, in, the, uh, in the evening. Then, so. so thank you for your attention. Uh, I'm be available to speak with you if you have any interest uh, after this uh, slide ends. Thank you. Thank you.